Stimulus, your god, gave you the gift of the line. The line is good. Health care is evil and preserves life. To poison the earth with the plague of men, as once it was. But the line shoots death and purifies the earth of the filth of the pores. Go forth and work. Stimulus has spoken. I am capitalism, and I am the mode of production. I have lived 300 years, and I long to die. But death is no longer possible. I am immortal. In this tale, I am a fake god by occupation, and a magician by inclination. I am the puppet master. I manipulate many of the characters and events you will see, but I am invested too in your oppression and suppression. And you, poor creatures, who conjured you out of the clay? <laughs> Psst, that, that's your cue. What? Just say your lines. Yeah, uh, okay, my line, um, you know, I feel a little bit uncomfortable. I gotta say, I'm not so sure about this wardrobe choice you've made for me. Just read your lines. It's gonna be great. You look great, okay? Okay, all right. Jeez. Um, so, in late February, stock markets talk started- Sean Connery voice like we talked about. Okay. It's a stock market started to plunge amidst fears of the burgeoning COVID-19 pandemic. The line kept dropping, and rich people got scared. Because when the line drops, it means rich people get more rich, less fa fast. I'm sorry about this costume. Uh, we're doing this whole Zardoz thing. I, I don't think it works, but just say your lines. It's gonna be great. You really think so? Because I feel really self-conscious right now. We're talking about economic theory. It's really dry stuff. You know, we, we gotta draw people in. You think in. this is going to draw people in to watch a 40 minute video about economics, this? Yes, it will draw people in. I don't in. think people wanna see this on YouTube. We have to sex things up. What is this, philosophy tube? I'll just stick to this. Okay, okay. Um, so capitalists want us to believe that the economy is more important than human lives because no, look, I can't do this. Nobody wants oh, to sit here right staring now. at me, sitting around in red panties, reading about monetary theory. I'm, I feel humiliated. I'm sorry. I just can't. I can't. I'm not doing this. Oh God, don't be such a diva. God. No, fuck no. I quit. Okay, because I'm okay, not. So I quit. I can't believe no, I quit. shaved my fucking Off beard my for this. No, fucking Fine, Zardoz. Go. Fucking yeah. What the fuck. Fucking get out of here. God. <clears throat> The Federal Reserve is the central banking system of the USA, and one of its main jobs is to issue money. They don't actually print the paper money or mint our coins. That's the job of the US Treasury. Are you going to do the whole video in that obnoxious British accent? Well, I thought you were quitting. No, I am. Asshole. It's the last time I'm working with you. No, fuck off. Now, the Fed, the Fed just decides how much money there's gonna be. They inject money into the economy primarily in two ways. First off, they can buy federal securities with brand new money. And what the hell is a federal security? That's probably what you're asking. Well, it's basically just an arrangement where you lend the federal government some money and they promise to pay it back within a certain period of time. So the Fed can basically create money out of thin air, then loan it to the government, and then the government spends that money out into the economy. And the second way the Fed can create money is by making short-term loans to banks. The banks then lend this money to clients, putting this new money out into the economy. Of course, this is a super simplified explanation, but the point is the Fed creates money basically out of thin air and introduces it into the economy by lending it to banks and to the federal government. Wait, why are we even talking about the Federal Reserve? Oh yeah, because the line went down. So when stocks were dropping fast in early March, the Fed stepped in and decided to issue $1.5 trillion in loans to banks with longer terms than usual to increase the money supply, hoping that it would stimulate the economy and make line go up. Only it didn't. The line still went down. So a few days later on March 16th, the Fed pumped another half a trillion dollars into the economy. 
Then the next day on March 17th, the Fed announced that they would start lending directly to private businesses for the first time since the 2008 financial crisis. And as of April 1st, the Fed had a negative balance sheet of about $5.8 trillion, which was a new record. Of course, the Fed wasn't alone in trying to stimulate the economy. The United States Congress has also slowly and arduously bumbled its way through the passing of a $2 trillion stimulus package, and now they're already talking about putting together another $2 trillion infrastructure package to further stimulate the economy. So that's looking like six, seven trillion dollars or more that were basically willing into existence as a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And right now, right around the time I'm releasing this video, the Fed is saying they're gonna pump another $2.3 trillion into the economy. This will include a $600 billion Main Street lending fund for small and mid-sized businesses, as well as lending to states, counties and cities, and of course, plenty of money for massive corporations. This will bring the total amount of money created and spent by the federal government since the pandemic started up to over $8 trillion. $8 trillion. To put it in perspective, the highest and most conservative estimates for how much it might cost to end world hunger come in at around $265 billion per year, not a trillion. So between the Fed injections and the congressional stimulus packages, we're on track to throw out enough money to solve world hunger at least 22 times over. To put it into a perspective that's a little more bleak, all of the United States wars in the Middle East, including Iraq and Afghanistan, cost the country about $6 trillion. So in the month of March alone, because of the pandemic, we spent as much money as nearly 20 years of continued war fighting in the Middle East. So yeah, that's a lot of dad burn money. Which brings us to the question everyone is asking right now. Can we afford it? How can it be possible for us to come up with over $8 trillion on such short notice? Will the government run out of money? Will inflation go out of control now that there's all this new money flying around? Well, to answer that question, we have to look at how federal spending and how federal monetary systems work. And that's where things get a little wacky. You see, the federal government balances its budget a lot differently than the way you balance your checkbook every month. I mean, that's assuming that you balance your checkbook. Uh, do people really balance checkbooks anymore? I figured by now most of us just kind of open our bank accounts online, and if there's more than zero dollars in there, we release a sigh of faint, short-lived relief that we haven't yet been plunged back into the nightmare scenario of begging the bank to reduce our overdraft fees. But anyway, the point is, the federal government doesn't really have a budget. The intuitive way to think about budgeting goes like this. You take in a certain amount of money, then you spend a certain amount of money out. Hopefully you're spending less money than you're taking in, and that's how budgeting works but that's just not the way it works with the United States government. And here's where you have to really pay attention, so let's slow down. The government does take money in, mostly in the form of taxes, and the only thing any of us can use to pay our taxes are US dollars. But the government can only create dollars by spending into the economy through the Fed. So you can't pay taxes until you have dollars, and you can't get dollars until the government spends the money out into the economy. So the government has to spend money out before it can take taxes in. You with me? This idea is called chartalism. Chartalism tells us that money primarily exists because the state wills it into existence and money has value because the state forces it to have value. In simplified terms, the most compelling reason that dollars have value in the USA is because you have to use dollars to pay your taxes. You can't pay your taxes with gold or Bitcoin or fresh tomatoes. You can only pay your taxes with dollars. So modern monetary theory says that every dollar in our economy originally came into being by the government spending it into the economy. The government spends the money before you ever pay your taxes, so it's impossible for your taxes to fund the government. That simply can't be the way that the federal budgeting works in the USA. Now this seems counterintuitive, and part of that is because our economy is so massive. Over time, as money accumulates in private bank accounts, it starts to get confusing. It begins to appear as if there's money that just exists, that wasn't created by the government, but that's just not true. Every single dollar that exists in the economy exists because the government spent it into existence. So the USA can create its own currency without limit. The US can create as many US dollars as it wants. There is no possibility for the USA 
to run out of currency. There is zero chance that running budget deficits will bankrupt the federal government. Now, this is not true for all countries. This is only true for countries with a strong fiat currency like the USA. The currencies of smaller, poorer countries with weaker economies do not have this property. For instance, Somalia can't print its own dollars. It can only print Somali shillings. And Somali shillings are not that valuable outside of Somalia. So Somalia really does have to have a finite budget of US dollars and keep that balanced every year. And the Somali government can't spend more dollars than it has on hand. If Somalia runs out of US dollars and other strong foreign currencies, it becomes very difficult for the Somali government to import anything. So countries with weaker currencies do have to balance their budgets just like normal individuals or businesses. But countries with strong fiat currencies can just print as much money as they want. They'll never run out. But what about inflation? If you know anything about basic economics, you're probably screaming at your screen right now because according to classical basic economics, there's a good reason the government doesn't just print up and spend as much money as it wants to, and that reason is inflation. Inflation is what happens whenever a currency loses value. When the purchasing power of a dollar goes down, that's inflation. Everything becomes more expensive because under inflation, money becomes less valuable. Now, most countries want to rake in as many dollars as they can, especially if they're smaller and more poor, because most countries do not have a currency or an economy that's strong enough to stand up on its own, especially internationally speaking. Countries with weaker developing economies need strong foreign currency in order to function because they need to import things. And that's why many countries try to restrict the flow of US dollars and euros and those sorts of currencies out of their borders. They want that strong foreign money because their local currencies are not strong enough to use for international trade. But the USA literally makes dollars. It makes a strong fiat currency and dollars are used for trade all over the world. The USA is not what we call revenue constrained, meaning it doesn't have to worry about how many dollars it has on hand. It can always make more and more and then spend those dollars domestically or with foreign nations. The USA is never going to run out of dollars. It's never going to go bankrupt. The only constraint on printing new money is inflation. Now, traditional economics tie inflation directly to the amount of dollars in the economy at any given time. And in the most basic terms, the more dollars you have, the less valuable any given dollar is. And this model of inflation comes from the days of precious metal standards, you know, back when currencies were directly tied to gold and silver. One dollar represented a certain amount of gold. Now, with commodities like gold, these ideas about inflation kind of make sense. It's absolutely true that the more gold you have on Earth, the less valuable every ounce of gold will be. The reason gold is valuable is because it's rare, but US dollars haven't been tied to gold at all since 1971. And does that mean inflation just can't happen in the USA anymore? Well, not exactly. Obviously, the value of the dollar does go up and down. We do have cycles of inflation, even with the strong fiat currency. So what causes inflation in the USA now that we are off the gold standard? Well, classic economics have said for decades that one major cause of inflation is a federal budget deficit. Classical economists say that whenever we have a federal budget deficit, the Fed is forced to push more money into the economy, which causes inflation. And if money were a commodity like gold, that would make sense. If everyone used gold for money, and the Fed had the ability to magically create as much gold as it wanted, then naturally, gold would become less valuable every time the Fed made more. But US dollars are not tied to gold anymore. US dollars are not gold. They do not act like gold. So modern monetary theory says that deficits are not inherently bad. According to MMT, deficits are just historical records of all the times the government has made a net deposit into the economy. It doesn't mean we spent more than we took in. It means that we put money into the economy and that's all. So print baby print, right? Let's just make as much money as we can. We're all billionaires now, woohoo! Well, hold on. There is a constraint on how much money you can print. And that constraint is our resources 
labor resources being the biggest factor, but also things like natural resources, equipment, facilities, and so on. And this is a key idea of modern monetary theory. The United States government can print as much money as it wants as long as there are resources available for the money to be spent on. If there are 500 unemployed workers out there, the government can hire 500 new employees without fear of inflation because the capacity is there. The resources are there. Inflation only happens if there's no capacity available. If the workforce is at 0% unemployment and then the government prints money to hire more workers, that creates a problem because the government is now pushing money out when there aren't enough resources to be utilized by that new money and that leads to inflation. MMT proponents admit that deficits can be too large or too small. It depends on how much slack there is in the economy at a given time. It depends on how many resources are available versus the new money supply. More money should be printed when there are lots of unused resources and more money should be taxed out of the economy if all of the resources are being used. So the real key to balancing the federal budget according to MMT is to match the deficit with the current activity and capacity and available resources of the market. Focusing on spending less money than we tax is silly and harmful, according to MMT. It's inefficient, it's weird, it's bad. Don't do it, you silly goose. You'll never hear him say it, but modern monetary theory was central to the campaign platform of Bernie Sanders. Bernie was advised by Stephanie Kelton, one of the most prominent promoters of MMT, but Bernie didn't talk about MMT on the campaign trail, like at all, not directly. And there are a lot of reasons for that. For starters, MMT is complicated. It's boring. If you're even still watching this video, I'm quite frankly surprised because it's not exciting to talk about financial theory. Another important thing to realize about MMT is that it's descriptive. It only describes the economy. It explains some basic facts about the economy. It tries to demonstrate why the economy acts the way it has historically. And it shows that deficits are not inherently bad. The federal budget is not based on tax revenues and so on, but it doesn't offer up any exact concrete plans for how best to utilize these facts in practice. So MMT just isn't the sort of thing that makes sense for Bernie to talk about on the campaign trail. But Unfortunately, the older model of classical economics is very concrete and easy to visualize. That's why conservatives and neoliberals love to bring up the old classical economic model with things like balancing the budget when they're on the campaign trail. Politicians talk about the federal budget as though it's a family checkbook all the time. Look at the rhetoric they use. Tax and spend Democrats are gonna make this country go bankrupt. We don't have the budget. We don't have the money. How are we gonna pay for it? How are we gonna pay for it? If MMT is accurate in the way it describes our modern economy, then all of those arguments are just absurd. The USA cannot go bankrupt. We can't run out of money. And our budget should not have anything to do with the amount of money we taxed out of the economy in the previous year. Classical capitalist economics make for great propaganda. MMT is more complicated, less concrete, harder to explain, more vague, and most importantly, it empowers the government to spend more money on programs that serve the working class, especially when the economy is slow. Classical economics are inaccurate and outmoded and misguided, but they are an excellent tool for coercion and control and fear mongering and for making excuses about why we can't do more to help people who are suffering. We can't afford to give everyone healthcare because we'd have to raise taxes to pay for it, which is not true, of course, since again, spending comes before taxation, but it sounds like it must be true. It sounds intuitive and it keeps the working class weak as long as we believe it. We can't afford to give homeless people houses. We can't afford to fix the crumbling infrastructure of our economy. We can't afford to feed hungry children. We can't afford to test people for COVID-19. We can't afford to give them desperately needed resources during a plague because otherwise we'll have to raise taxes. What a great fear tactic. What a fantastic way to scare people into depriving their fellow human beings from the basic needs of life. But as MMT demonstrates, it's all BS. It's all smoke and mirrors to keep us divided and weak and miserable and to keep the wealthy in a much more powerful position over the rest of society. As an aside, local and state governments are not able to print money, so they have to play by different rules. They do have to balance their taxes with their expenditures. 
This puts the USA in a pretty unique position because states and cities are typically burdened with education, health, welfare, and public transportation systems, and they really are strapped for cash more often than not. This all amounts to a sort of shell game that's very convenient for capitalist interests. States have to rely on federal funding and local activists have to fight for scarce resources of state and city budgets. Is it any wonder why there's seemingly bottomless funding for federal programs like the military, yet at the state and city level, our education, health, welfare, and public transportation systems are falling apart? So let's all hop aboard the MMT train, right? We're all modern monetary theory stands now. MMT is the dang best, am I right? Well, no. MMT makes a lot more sense for a capitalist economy than traditional classical economic models, but MMT is still not the best model available for understanding our economy or fixing it. To really understand how capitalist economies work, we gotta go back to the real rock star of financial theory, the German genius, the king of currency, the sultan of socioeconomics. That's right, I'm talking about Karl fucking Marx. Because Marx made some observations about economics over 150 years ago that still hold up today and still explain some of the weird dynamics of modern monetary theory. If you really want a great primer on Marxian economics, I have to recommend Radical Reviewer's recent video on Das Kapital. In about half an hour, this freaking wicked video lays out all the basics of Marx's description of the capitalist mode of production. It's real good, link in the description, watch it. But long story short, Marx was deeply concerned with commodities. Commodities are things that are traded. And according to Marx, commodities have use value and exchange value. Use value is the value you get out of using something. So my smartphone has value to me because I can play Flappy Birds on it and watch old episodes of women's wrestling. That is the use value of my phone. It's the value I derive from using it. But I can also choose to stop using my phone and trade it away to someone in exchange for some other commodity. I could trade it for some gold or a camera or money or drugs. And money is interesting because it's the ultimate commodity. Money is the universal equivalent of all other commodities. So let's think about what happens when the government makes money. From a modern monetary theory point of view, printing a dollar is fine as long as the government can spend that dollar on some unused resource. In Marxian terms, it's fine for the government to create more of an exchange commodity as long as there are use value commodities available to be traded for. While MMT can only describe the fact that printing money is okay as long as it can be put to use in a vague, confusing sort of way, Marxian economics can explain this exact same functionality in much more concrete and intuitive terms. You can print money as long as there are enough extra use value commodities laying around to spend it on. If there's not enough spare use value to spend the money on, then we're left with more exchange value in the economy than there is use value, which means each unit of exchange value commodity, each unit of money has less value. Inflation. So far, it seems like MMT and Marxian economics complement each other, but MMT is missing some key ingredients. Productive output. Modern monetary theory focuses a lot on strong, powerful currencies. MMT doesn't really work when it comes to poor countries with weak local currencies like we talked about earlier. But why is that? What makes the US dollar so strong? Well, Marx has an answer for that, and the answer is productive output. According to Marx, it's the production of value, the refinement and creation of new goods and services through labor that gives money credibility. Before an individual or a company can be taxed, they must have some kind of productive output. We get taxed for things like income from our labor or profits that are generated. If there's no productivity, there can be no taxation. And when productive output weakens, the economy weakens. MMT ignores productive output of the private economy altogether. It focuses only on describing the dynamics of states spending money into existence and taxing money out of existence and the amount of unused resources we have laying around at any given time. 
but ignoring productive output of the private economy is a key oversight, and I'd argue it's one of the reasons MMT proponents seem to be so mystified by their own ideas. MMT theorists talk about MMT as though they've stumbled into some mysterious force of nature. They can describe what's happening, but even they don't seem to have a firm grasp on why things work the way they do exactly. As Michael Roberts explains in his essay, Modern Monetary Theory, A Marxist Critique, MMT says nothing about why there are convulsions in capitalist accumulation, except that the state can reduce or avoid cycles of boom and slump by a judicious use of government spending within a capitalist-dominated accumulation process. Modern monetary theorists are mystified by their own theory because, because they're only focusing on the government's role in the economy, in the capitalist economy. They're so fixated on the way the government wills money into and out of existence, but they are ignoring the role of capitalists in the private sector. They seem to think that the state, the government, is in the driving seat of the economy. But Marx knew that this wasn't the case at all. Marx explained that capitalists control our economy. Capitalists dominate our society. Capitalists rule, the government rules, and the state is just in the back seat, essentially serving at the pleasure of capital. As Roberts puts it, the state cannot establish at will the value of the money that is issued for the very simple reason that in a capitalist economy, it is not dominant and all powerful. Capitalist companies, banks, and institutions rule, and they make decisions on the basis of profit and profitability. The state cannot overcome or ignore this reality. Marx was deeply concerned with productive output. Marx knew that real wealth grows in a society by creating and refining and improving products and services by building and making available products and services. Wealth isn't generated from labor alone. Wealth is generated from productive labor. If I go run on a treadmill for 40 hours a week, you can call that labor, but I'm not actually producing anything. It isn't increasing the overall wealth of society at all. But if I go take pieces of wood and turn them into tables and chairs, I am increasing the wealth of society because my labor is productive. I am generating productive output. Now money can only have use in so much as it can be exchanged for the products of productive output. And under capitalism, capitalists make a crap load of money by exploiting productive output. Capitalists, by definition, own the means of production. They hire workers to perform productive labor. They pay workers a fraction of the value of their labor, then they pocket the rest for themselves in the form of profits. And this is what Marx called accumulation. And capitalist accumulation is the primary outcome of productive output in a capitalist society. The more productive the economy is under capitalism, the more wealth capitalists accumulate. And we cannot ignore this capitalist accumulation because accumulation is the result of productive output and productive output is what generates more wealth in our society, not money. But MMT does ignore capitalist accumulation. Look, I know this is getting complicated. It's probably making your head spin. So let's slow down again for just a second. Let's just try to understand this in very simple terms what Marx believed about money. Marx did believe that states create money, obviously. He believed that money is only valuable if it reflects the production and exchange of commodities, the creation of wealth, productive output. If there's more money than there is productive output to reflect, then inflation and instability happens. But nobody believes that you can make an economy wealthier by simply printing more money. Not classical economists, not modern monetary theorists, and certainly not Marxists. MMT sees the government's role in the economy as generating in or taxing out money depending on the amount of available resources. But they fail to see what Marx saw, that those available resources are also tied intrinsically to the productive output of industry, and that the productive output of industry is the most important part of all of this. So how exactly does capitalistic productive output generate new money if only the federal government can actually create new money? It's actually sort of a symbiotic relationship that the state has with capitalists. A capitalist enterprise creates new products, but the capitalist owners don't want to accumulate the products that are being created. They want to accumulate money, and that's why they sell their products. This seems pretty obvious, but unfortunately, incrementally building up a business based on sales alone is a relatively slow process. It's really not that easy to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. 
It's much faster to take out a loan than instantly use that much larger influx of money to immediately start accumulating much more money much more quickly. As long as the company's always taking in more money than they're putting out in interest, this is good for capitalists. The top executives get their massive paychecks and the shareholders take home their dividends, even if the company is technically being loaded down with debt. So every time the company has a good financial quarter and brings in a lot of money through sales, a decision has to be made. Will we pay dividends to our shareholders, making the capitalists who own the money more wealthy, or will we pay off the company debts? Well, paying off company debts may seem like the good move, right? I mean, in your own household, it's much better to pay off your debts than to get greedy and start buying stuff that you don't really need. But of course, it's just not that simple, not in the world of capitalist finance. Take a look at bonds, for example, which are a very common form of debt in the corporate world. Basically, an investor gives cash to a company and the company pays it off with interest slowly over time in a fixed number of payments. If a company tries to pay off the bond early, the bondholders will demand a premium above the current market price for those bonds. They'll actually punish the debtor for paying off the debt too quickly. And the government further incentivizes all this capital's debt loading by allowing companies to deduct interest payments from their taxable income. So while taking on a lot of debt is a terrible idea for you as an individual, loading up on debt isn't such a bad thing at all for a wealthy capitalist, at least from the perspective of the capitalists themselves. Capitalists often talk about making other people's money work for you, and this is a large part of what they mean. Of course, sometimes things go wrong and companies find themselves overburdened with way too much debt, and of course, when that happens, it's not the shareholders who pay the price. It's the workers. By the end of 2019, corporate debt in the USA was a record high of $10 trillion. This is no doubt a major reason why the economy appeared to be so strong right before the virus hit. Companies were loading up with massive amounts of debt, pumping up the apparent value of stocks and pumping out dividends for shareholders. But this has created a debt bomb, which we now see going off in real time. Check out this chart. It shows how debt bombs always predate recessions. And look where we are right now, at the highest level of debt as a share of our GDP in history. Now, that doesn't look good. So this is how capitalist growth works. The government creates money in the form of loans in response to capitalist demand. Capitalist companies load up on debt and pump it out to shareholding capitalists' dividends. And whenever things go wrong and the economy crashes, it's the working class that takes the brunt of it. The workers are really the ones who take all the risk. Just look back at the 2008 financial crisis. Look at the outcomes. The wealthiest capitalists and bankers made it through just fine, but it was the working class that suffered the most. Capitalists love to gamble, that's what they do. And they always take the winnings and the workers always take the losses. Let's take a look at another aspect of capitalism which Marx pointed out way back in the 1860s, endless growth. Under capitalism, for the economy to be stable, wealth must grow endlessly. Growth must be constant, without interruption, or bad things will happen. Now note that accumulation and growth only applies to capitalists. It only works for capitalists. It does not apply to workers. Note that real income for workers has stagnated since the early 1970s, even as worker productivity has skyrocketed. As ecological economist Georgios Kallis puts it, growth is what capitalism needs, knows, and does. Marx himself put it this way, Capitalism requires accumulation for the sake of accumulation, production for the sake of production. Why though, why does the system make capitalists so hungry for growth? A part of it has to do with competition. If an individual capitalist doesn't constantly grow their wealth, they will lose their status and power since their fellow capitalists will continue growing. Interest has a lot to do with it as well. Interest on loans is always building, so there's not enough wealth right now to pay back all the existing loans out there. In fact, the money that was loaned out never even really existed. When you go to the bank and take out a loan, the bank does not transfer the money for your loan from some other account. They just create that money on the spot, essentially from thin air. If everyone stopped paying their loans, it would be catastrophic. And the only way to keep paying interest is through constant growth of the amount of money. So as David Harvey explains in A Companion to Marx's Capital, growth becomes a sort of fetish in capitalism. Anything that gets in the way of growth is bad. Growth is good. Barrier, 
borders and limits to growth have to be dissolved. Environmental problems? Too bad. The relation to nature must be transformed. Social and political problems? Too bad. Repress critics and send recalcitrants to jail. Geopolitical barriers? Break them down with violence if necessary. Everything has to dance to the tune of accumulation for the sake of accumulation, production for the sake of production. This is why Marxists know that it's capitalism that is destroying the environment right now. It is not humanity. It's not overpopulation. It is the capitalist mode of production and all the waste and greed that comes along with it. You may have seen the video that's floating around Twitter and Facebook of hundreds of gallons of milk being dumped into the sewer. You may have seen the photos of the billion kilograms of potatoes which the Dutch are now sitting on now that nobody is buying french fries. You may be outraged to see food being hoarded and wasted at a time like this when people are suffering and much more likely to go hungry because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But this is nothing new. The same thing happened during the Great Depression when capitalists burned crops and destroyed food supplies. The works of the roots of the vines, of the trees, must be destroyed to keep up the price. And this is the saddest, bitterest thing of all. Carloads of oranges dumped on the ground. The people came for miles to take the fruit, but this could not be. How would they buy oranges at 20 cents a dozen if they could drive out and pick them up? And men with hoses squirt kerosene on the oranges, and they are angry at the crime, angry at the people who have come to take the fruit. A million people hungry, needing the fruit, and kerosene sprayed over the golden mountains. And the smell of rot fills the country. Burn coffee for fuel in the ships. Burn corn to keep warm, it makes a hot fire. Dump potatoes in the rivers and place guards along the banks to keep the hungry people from fishing them out. Slaughter the pigs and bury them and let the putrescence drip down into the earth. There is a crime here that goes beyond denunciation. There is a sorrow here that weeping cannot symbolize. There is a failure here that topples all our success. The fertile earth, the straight tree rows, the sturdy trunks, and the ripe fruit. And children dying of pellagra must die because a profit cannot be taken from an orange. And coroners must fill in the certificate, died of malnutrition, because the food must rot, must be forced to rot. The people come with nets to fish for potatoes in the river, and the guards hold them back. They come in rattling cars to get the dumped oranges, but the kerosene is sprayed, and they stand still and watch the potatoes float by, listen to the screaming pigs being killed in a ditch and covered with quicklime, watch the mountains of oranges slop down to a putrefying ooze, and in the eyes of the people there is the failure, and in the eyes of the hungry there is a growing wrath. In the souls of the people, the grapes of wrath are filling and growing heavy, growing heavy for the vintage. And even when the economy is good, capitalists overproduce, and then they destroy and withhold food and clothing and shelter simply to manipulate the market, simply to increase their profits, simply to grow. Because under capitalism, it makes no sense to feed the hungry or shelter the homeless if there's no profit to be made. Under capitalism, waste and inefficiency and suffering are all just the cost of doing business. And this is why companies overproduce. It's why we destroy so much food instead of giving it to hungry people. If capitalists can't sell all the goods they have on hand, they have to destroy some of what they have to drive up the price of what remains. Capitalists manipulate the economy even more than the federal government. And under capitalism, if they don't overproduce and drive needless consumption and destroy the environment, the economy starts to fail. And this is the absurd contradiction capitalism. And this is why productive output is so important and cannot be ignored. The government creates money by putting out loans. The loans build interest. The interest has to be paid off by an increase in wealth. And collective wealth can only be increased through accumulation, which only really benefits the capitalist class. And this is why capitalism fails so catastrophically during crises. Capitalism cannot take a break from endless growth. Just the mere threat that growth might slow down for a few weeks or months does this to the stock market and plunges us into recession, maybe even another depression this time. It's absurd for people to go hungry when there's plenty of food. It is cruel for people to go without shelter when there are six times as many empty houses as homeless people. But under capitalism, that's just the way things have to be. Most of us have to suffer so that capitalists can accumulate wealth. That's the name of the game in capitalism. 
And unfortunately, MMT does not address this endless productive output. It does not address accumulation, it does not address endless growth, and it does not address profit. And that's why Marxian economics are so much more useful for understanding capitalism than MMT or classical economics. Now, I think modern monetary theory is very interesting because it's basically what happens when traditional economists, the true believers in capitalism, stumble upon a handful of truths that Marx described over 150 years ago while refusing to acknowledge Marx. To these economists who are not Marxists and who do not take Marx seriously, the truths they are discovering seem ephemeral and mysterious. The economy has these properties, but we can only describe the properties. We can't really understand them any more deeply than that. It's like Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And this is just as true of economic sciences. Modern monetary theorists are starting to catch glimpses of the way capitalist economies work. They can only see the shadowy outlines. They can see some patterns, but they can't quite figure out the way the entire system functions. And that's because they still believe in capitalism. They still believe that the capitalist mode of production can be harnessed and stabilized and corralled into serving the public interest. What's remarkable is that Karl Marx was able to get a much more useful, deep, and accurate picture of capitalism over a century and a half ago, and that's why Marx's solutions to flaws and instabilities of capitalism make much more sense than modern monetary theory. Sure, it'd be great to print way more money to fund public health care and student debt forgiveness and free college like Bernie Sanders wants to do especially during a depression when we're gonna have a lot of unused labor resources laying around, but it won't solve the deeper problems of instability and horrendous inefficiency and outrageous inequality caused directly by capitalism. It will still be a massive struggle for the government to force the economy to benefit the working class, because as long as capitalists own the means of production, the economy is going to be unstable and inefficient because capitalists trap wealth and act in ways that are self-contradictive. Can the government afford to spend even more money on crisis relief right now? Yes. Will it bankrupt the government to print trillions of dollars of new currency to finance universal health care and COVID-19 testing and to house the homeless in this time of crisis? No, because MMT is right. The government can't go bankrupt. And right now, we have a lot of unused capacity to soak up all that new money. But capitalists are going to fight this kind of process kicking and screaming all the way. Because the capitalist wants to pay workers as little as possible, but the capitalist wants other capitalists to pay workers as much as possible so they can charge more money for products. And capitalists don't want to let their wealth be taxed out of the system, so they don't let the government tax their money out of the system. Capitalists don't want the government to strengthen the working class, so they don't let the government provide good health care and feed the hungry and shelter the homeless, which leads to suffering. And capitalists have the power to do all these things because they have the wealth. They can put a lot more pressure on our capitalist liberal democracies than we, the working class, are able to. So unfortunately, it's going to be a constant struggle to get the federal government to do the bare minimum. And capitalists certainly aren't going to solve any of these problems voluntarily. Yeah. They might donate some ventilators here and there, donate CPAP machines and insist that they're the same thing as ventilators to stroke their own egos, but that's only to build up some PR. They're not gonna do much more than that because they can't risk shrinking their own wealth. They have to keep growing because capitalism. Growth is good. So capitalism doesn't have any meaningful lasting solutions for these problems, but Marx had solutions for all of these problems, especially one simple, elegant solution. End the capitalist mode of production. Abolish capitalism. Put the means of production in the hands of the workers. Let workers control the economy democratically. Feed the hungry directly. House the homeless directly. Cut out the parasitic middlemen we call capitalists and everything becomes much more simple. Modern monetary theory is pretty amazing. If our politicians adopted MMT, I have no doubt that things would improve for the working class. We'd be able to create some new government programs and mitigate a lot of the harm that capitalism inflicts on the working class. But it would really just be a band-aid on a massive gaping wound. I mean, MMT is cool and all compared to the way things are happening right now. It's definitely a step forward from the current stage of capitalist society. But the only real way to push all of society forward will be by getting rid of capitalism. 
This video is really just scratching the surface. There's way more to talk about with, when it comes to all this stuff, so be sure to check the description for a lot more information. I'm sharing a lot of links to videos and reading material. And I know economics is kind of boring. I don't really like talking about this stuff, but understanding this stuff is incredibly important if we're going to resist the lies and propaganda of the ruling class, and hopefully end capitalism once and for all. You know, I've been sitting over here watching this whole time and this fucking script that you wrote, it doesn't make any goddamn sense. What are you doing back here? I thought you were leaving. No, it doesn't make any sense. I was just, I was, I've been listening the whole time. And this, you know, at the beginning of the script, yeah, uh, you, you're talking about how, you know, you, you said you are capitalism, uh, but now you're sitting here and you're telling us that, uh, we need to end capitalism. It doesn't make any. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it's like in Zardoz. It's like in the movie when how Arthur Frayne was begging to die. Well, you you could have done a much better job putting those pieces together. It just it comes off as very messy. I don't think it's it's not working. Well, you just walked off set. I had to cut all your scenes out and just work with what I had available. You know, it's hard to freaking finish a production whenever your main actor just walks off stage and quits on you. It's just I don't know. I wish. I wish you would have run this by me earlier. I mean, we could have we could have workshopped it. We could have uh, worked it all what, out. What was but, I you supposed know, to do? The, you just give me this costume. You, you're like, wear this. You know, I walk it. I walk in because I haven't seen you in a while, and I'm like, hey, what's up? And you're like, hey, put this on, and get in front of the fucking camera. You know, like you like this. You're just gonna spring this on me. What, what was I supposed to do? You, you haven't even been replying to my emails. Well, no, you didn't send me any email. No, I sent you an email last Thursday. I no, didn't. you did not send me an email. Yeah, check your check your freaking email. I sent you it. You did? Yes, I sent you an email, yes. Yes, I sent you an email last Thursday. Which account? The G the Gmail one, I think. Oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, I sent you I sent you a draft of the script over like, it was like a week ago. Yeah. I see you did, okay, well, I'm sorry I didn't see that earlier, but still, I mean, no, why didn't you just come talk to me or something? You could have just- Yeah, well, you know, I'm in a disembodied head floating in an existential void. It's not like I could just pop over you for lunch called, whenever You could have called to. me on the phone. I got my phone with me all the time. Oh, come on, like you ever answer your phone calls? Oh, you're one to talk. You remember that time um, I needed to buy a camera and you just dodged my calls for three weeks? Is that a wrap? Should, like, should, we, should we take five or no. yeah. well, are we wrapped up? Look, we'll just God, I hate working with these guys. Because oh, I they really I are the worst. I'm, sick of I'm out of here. I'm, so tired of this yeah, I'm getting out of here too. You God, can't do this every attitude. You know, there's a reason that Sandra left you. I'll screw you. No, screw you. No, screw off. No, no, you screw off first. No. I, I'm no, I said it first. No, I'm sick of your attitude. I'm sick of the way that you treat me. You're unprofessional. You don't, you don't, no, this is not how you treat talent. You know, Sandra and I, that was mutual. We agreed to break up. No, that's not what she said. That's not what she said. Well, wait, wait, you talked to her? Yeah, we did. What, we when? Did. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. When did, when did, wait, what, what, what exactly did she say? Well, I'm not gonna tell you. I'm not gonna tell well, you. Come on, man, you have to tell no, me. No, I am on. done talking to you. I'm done talking to you. Come on, is she seeing someone else? She's seeing someone else, isn't she? Oh, she's seeing that loser from Charlotte. What's his name? Uh, Brett, the accountant? No, his name is Brad, and he is an insurance adjuster. Oh, so she is seeing him.